Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I'm the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the challenging circumstances we are all in, and I hope everyone in the audience today is safe and healthy. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and the latest victim, Casey Goodson. We grieve for so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of state-sanctioned violence and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. As this list continues to grow, Moad will continue to say their names as our commitment to honoring the victims and to attaining true racial justice is unwavering. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, we reside on unceded native lands and thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We are excited about today's discussion, After Hope, Artists in Conversation, presented in partnership by Museum of the African Diaspora and the Asian Art Museum, in conjunction with the exhibition, After Hope, Videos of Resistance, which will be on view at the Asian Art Museum. I wanna thank everyone here who has joined us today, including our First Republic Bank's VIPs, with special appreciation for those who have donated to the museum during this pandemic. We would not be able to produce this programming without your support. We would love to hear where you're joining us from tonight. So take a moment to type into the chat where you're calling from. I'm grateful this evening to curator Padma Maitland and the Asian Art Museum's Abby Chen and to MOAD's Elena Gross for working with me and community on tonight's event. Please note that full bios for all of tonight's participants can be found on the MOAD website calendar, and I'll put a link to that in the chat. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Elisa Alexander is not able to join us this evening, but we are lucky to have Padma Maitland to graciously step in as moderator. Padma Maitland is Assistant Professor of Architectural History and Theory at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, he is also co-curator of the After Hope Videos of Resistance program and exhibition at the Asian Art Museum. Please join me in welcoming Padma. Thank you, wonderful to be here. Um, so again, my name is Padma Maitland and I'm one of the co-curators uh, and organizers of the After Hope program at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Marking the inauguration of the Asian Art Museum's trilogy series, after Hope brings together artists, activists, and community leaders for an interdisciplinary and critical examination of hope's potential to animate form, method, and action. The prompt to think after addresses both the complex ways hope affects our vision for the future and judgment of the past, asking both what it means to go after hope and what comes after hope. It's an honor to be here with everyone for tonight's program. First, uh, thank you to Elizabeth uh, Gessel and Elena Gross and everyone at MOAD for co-hosting this program and making tonight possible, and to the team at the Asian Art Museum for their help and support as well. Partnerships between institutions is a key uh, aspect of the After Hope project, expanding the conversation and offering new perspectives on art and cultural production as inseparable from daily life, politics, and policies. Tonight's event feels particularly poignant bringing together two San Francisco-based institutions who have traditionally focused on distinct communities, histories, and collections to host a conversation between artists. What new connections might be forged, alliances made, or futures imagined? In an era defined by a global pandemic and political upheaval, how can we rethink what it means to mobilize and build solidarity? Caught between a renewed call to shelter in place and a simultaneously urgent call to work together for radical change, how can we find new ways to inspire, stay connected, and facilitate hope? So it's my pleasure to introduce our four speakers tonight, uh, Tiffany Chung, Cheryl Derricote, 
Connie Jung and Simone Daly. Tiffany Chung is internationally noted for her research-based multimedia installations and cartographic works that examine conflict, migration, urban transformation, and environmental impact in relationship to the history of specific places. Chung has exhibited at museums and biennales worldwide, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum in DC, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Nobel Peace Center Museum in Oslo, and the 56th Venice Biennale. Uh, Cheryl Derricote is a visual artist and her favorite mediums are glass and paper. Originally from Washington, DC, she lives and makes art in San Francisco, California. Connie Jung is a Chinese born artist, writer and filmmaker based out of Oakland, California. Her work examines diverse articulations of hope amidst ongoing ecological catastrophe, possibilities for expanding the language of climate apocalypse and the racialization of contamination narratives as told through visual and text-based forms. Simone Bailey is an artist who utilizes video, performance, sculpture, and site-specific installations in her artistic practice. Her practice is an interrogation of disembodied poetics and the impulse to grasp the intangible. Her work focuses on perception, process, ephemerality, desire, hybridity, violence, and the impossible, all while maintaining an intimate proximity to blackness. So we'll begin tonight's program with short presentations by each artist. Uh, after the presentations, there'll be a chance for conversation among the presenters before we open the discussion to questions from the audience. So if you have questions you want to ask during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat or question window uh, and we'll save them for the discussion at the end of the program. Um, so thank you again for all our presenters for being and joining tonight and for sharing their work. Uh, with that, uh, I will hand it over to Tiffany. Thank you. Thanks, Pema for, and Elizabeth for the introduction. And thanks to the organizers um, to put together this meaningful conversation. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, for this short presentation, I will give uh, an overview of my practice by going through a diverse repertoire of projects that unpack issues of conflict, policy, uh, natural and anthropogenic disaster extreme climate impact, progress and transformation inducing forced migration and displacement, mostly in traumatized places of the global south. Um, I will read some excerpts from my lecture performance um, and from an essay that I wrote for Connectedness, an incomplete encyclopedia of the Anthropocene. Uh, this is a book edited by Marianne Crow for the Danish Pavilion at the 2021 Venice Architecture Biennale. So these excerpts will give insight um, into the driving force behind my work. So I will begin. If water has memories, it will remember what I remember, even in fragments. 1978, new economic zone, Mekong River, tropic migration, floodplain. Every afternoon, a child sits on the windowsill of her new home far away from the home of her childhood. Her Siamese fighting fish swims in a jar next to her, both staring at the rising sea of brown water that swallows what it can. People no longer walk, only boats move in and out of homes. Her mom's long black hair floats in the room every morning. Memories of water stay with the girl between her sleeping and waking hours for many years to come. Little did she know that today there are 56 hydropower infrastructures in the Mekong River Basin. With the additional 31 dams under construction, 74 planned and 23 proposed ones, dams alter the flow of water and with sudden fluctuations in water level, disrupt fish migration and spawning. Flood occurred with dams and with sea level rise due to climate change will exacerbate the negative impacts of such stagnant ecosystem. In the lower Mekong Basin alone, over 60 million people depend on the river as their lifeblood, food supply, health, income, culture, and identity. The continuing hydropower development will further aggravate poverty in the region. April 2009. I recently asked my mother about her trips to this river many years ago. 
where she stood quietly for hours by the riverbank. Walls of fog surrounded her tiny frame, waiting and hoping for my father to appear from the other side through thick clouds of mist, or so she had hoped. And there she kept waiting, 17th parallel, February 1971 to October 1984. In captivity, he was transferred from prison to prison. He was put to hard labor in one re-education camp to another. In dark, solitary confinement, his thoughts conjured up creative activities. After 14 years, 14 years, his name was finally called. My father just sat there and his mind froze. 1980. The water embodies sleepless nights as it watches people's shadows submerge in darkness. The boat departs from Gurdite River mouth, fighting its way to international waters, hanging on the edges of our boat, vomiting, fainting, time passing, gunshot. People without shadows push one another towards the fish compartment. Please get off my chest, our breath. Little sister, bleeding in darkness, bottom of the boat. The night feels heavier with the lack of oxygen. In between breathless breaths is the sound of jewelry and watches being dropped into a tin can. Bodies frozen, souls restless, mouths muzzled. Border patrols wait until all valuables are stripped off in the blackness of the night and airtight compartment. Suddenly, silence breaks into bodies rushing to emerge from the bottom, hurriedly inhaling a gulp of fresh air, spirits spiraling downward into the bottomless pit of despair. The sea embraces those who dive into it, leaving the imprints of their bodies in the water's memories. Between 2015 and 2018, I carry out my research, uh, my field research on the history of Vietnamese refugees in Hong Kong. I first met a group of them in March 2015 at a church picnic in Twin Moon New Territories in Hong Kong. It was only my second trip to Hong Kong, so everything was overwhelming. Um, I made it to the public, I mean, to the picnic site after several hours on the buses following the directions given by a man I had never met before. There I found myself sitting on the grass among a group of fellow Vietnamese, those who were allowed to integrate into Hong Kong society in 2000. For almost four years that followed, we spent countless hours riding buses and boats together, searching for the sites of former detention centers and refugee camps that were once home to the Vietnamese refugees and asylum seekers who landed in Hong Kong between 1975 and 2000. These refugees' personal accounts and experiences demand a comprehensive study and an analytical framework that makes imperative use of their perspectives and political agency in shaping the refugee discourse. In his book, A World Restored, Henry Kissinger defined a state as a collection of individuals, which achieves identity through the consciousness of a common history. He then went on to pronounce, quote, history is the memory of states, unquote. As a former refugee fleeing the authoritarian ruling of um, the communist regime after the war, I'm familiar with nation building rhetoric and indoctrination, capitalism and communism alike. History as political narratives produced through statecraft, omits, complex stories of conflict of interests, power, domination, and victimhood. The right to one's history and memory are pivotal and should not be constrained by ideology or political alignment. Walter Benjamin said, quote, to articulate what is past does not mean to recognize how it really was. It means to take control of a memory as it flashes in a moment of danger, unquote. Personally inheriting the legacy of the war in Vietnam and the subsequent refugee exodus, I have taken on many projects exploring what I call inherited historical memories, not just within the context of Vietnam, but also the Cold War and the global geopolitics at large, 
both historical and current. In fact, tracking the conflict and displacement in Syria has enabled me to confront the war in Vietnam, which has always been emotionally challenging. I'm interested in the complexities of war making, nation building projects, and on top of that, extreme climate impact. The layering negotiations between different groups of people and between people and their environment. Expansion and dispossession, settlement and displacement, Understanding forced migration within such framework, we can see how it is inextricably tied to, into poly, political, social, economic, and environmental processes. Well, let me end with this. The chronic flood projections in Climate Central's October 2019 study warned that rising seas could affect all and erase some coastal cities by the year 2050. Land currently home to 300 million people could fall below the high tide line in 30 years. Together with political and armed conflicts, climate and economic crises have produced and will continue to produce refugees. Redefining the term refugee constituted by the 1951 convention and the 1967 protocol relating to the status of refugees is not a hypothetical question or suggestion. The future is now. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Cheryl. Thank you. Thanks to, that was such a great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Um, thanks to Padma, Elizabeth, and Alisa in absentia um, for this opportunity. I really was intrigued by this conversation um, and the opportunity to unite two great museums um, in one place. So I'll dive in. The work I'm gonna share with you tonight, I really consider sort of the first phase of a project and it's a way to give you an insight into my process. Um, so we can just dive right in. Next slide, please. I stand for art and liberation. Um, I come from a family of artists and activists. My parents were musicians. And one of the stories my grandmother used to share with me was that my mom took me in uh, my stroller, much to her dismay, to marches for welfare mother's rights in uh, Washington DC, where I was from. And what was fascinating about this is that even though this was very much in my DNA and I was expressing all of it by the time I got to undergrad, um, my mother had no idea how in the world I could be an artist or an activist. And she kept a lot of this history secret from me. And it was only through conversations with my grandmother that I understood uh, why I might be an artist or a musician and also an activist. Next slide. So this particular project um, is called The Wolf in the Wheat, and it came about because I had the opportunity to do a micro residency at a place called Villa San Francisco, which is a new local residency housed at the French Consulate. And I did that through the auspices of Re Riddle Gallery as um, they curated the initial show for this new residency, The Hatch Series. Um, and in the sentence that everyone says a lot, there was going to be a physical show and then came COVID. So a big part of the challenge was really shifting a lot of the process online. And the way I decided to do that was both through the traditional online artist talks like the one we're having this evening, but also um, something I had never done, which was a highly curated Instagram. So the boxes of text that you're actually seeing on the left were on my Instagram page as an entree into this story about my own family's autobiography and Thomas Jefferson and the black side of his family, the Hemings. And so um, just because people will ask, it is true. My mother's maiden name was Jefferson and she very much wanted to prove that we were related to Thomas Jefferson. And unfortunately she did not live long enough to create, um, create that genealogical research. Next slide. 
So my mother's family actually came from Southwest Virginia, um, terribly close to Monticello, less than three hours. And so as I was doing this project, I began to think, oh my gosh, could my mother have been right? Um, because, you know, for years she would say, oh yeah, I know we're related to Thomas Jefferson, it has to be. And through doing this research at the French consulate, I actually learned that um, of the six children that Thomas Jefferson fathered by his slave, Sally Hemings, um, four of those children lived and three of them actually went by the name Jefferson and passed. So in fact, my mother may have been right after all. Next slide. I picked an image of Monticello with wheat as one of the central motifs in this work because um, part of the complexity, for lack of a better word, of Thomas Jefferson was that he believed somehow he could innovate the plantation. Tobacco, he thought, was a very uh, brutal crop, which was the normal crop in Virginia. Um, additionally, he saw cotton as kind of barbaric and really thought that somehow he was, you know, a little better than the plantations in the deep south and the brutality associated with cotton. So he decided to raise wheat. Um, wheat was also something that he very much wanted, having spent time in France, which brings us back to the connection of this project to the French consulate. Um, being what we would now call the French ambassador, he developed quite a love of French food. So having more wheat at his disposal meant that he would have more access um, to the breads he had grown to love during his time in France. Um, another interesting piece of this story was that um, it was Sally Hemings' older brother James that actually went first with Jefferson to France and trained as a chef de cuisine um, so that when they returned to the plantation, Jefferson would still have access to French food. Next slide. And so this particular quote, again, the quotes actually were the Instagram panels, um, is a quote that Jefferson said on three or four different occasions. And the wolf um, was his metaphor for slavery. And so I really wanted to position the wolf in the visual image, um, not just because of the Jefferson quote, but also because the wolf is a very storied figure, um, not just in American indigenous history, but also in French history. Um, and apologies to people who really speak French because my French is not that good, but there is um, a famous fable that was often quoted. Some of you may have read Genet that talks about le loup and le chien between dog and wolf. So there is this moment in the dark when you're not sure if you're seeing the wolf or you're seeing the dog. And it's sort of this fable about fear and you know what happens in the space in between of danger. And a lot of that I felt was reflected in this quote that Jefferson was often saying when he was debating slavery. Next slide. And so it is really, um, Interesting to look at these two countries' histories that were so intertwined. Um, during the time Jefferson was in France, Black people were actually free. Um, and so his slaves could have petitioned to stay in France and be free if they had wanted to. That's a whole nother conversation about why they didn't or you know, what kind of life ultimately would they have had in France even if they had because it wasn't like there were all these job opportunities necessarily just because they were free. Um, but this residency and starting this project was really an opportunity to understand um, how much of our history is still present in our contemporary dialogues. Next slide. And so there's the full triptych together where you see the central elements of both the wolf and the wheat and actually in the detail of the wallpaper, um, it is the wheat as the motif. Um, and so it really um, just shows that regardless of how much we think we've sort of escaped our past and escaped our history, um, it comes back around at points in our contemporary understanding, particularly when we try to understand things like race. Next slide. 
And so, you know, one of the central questions of this panel in line with the show is what comes after hope? Um, and when I thought about this question, I had to sort of back up and I thought, well, first you have anger. So after anger comes activism. And then after activism, I believe is when hope comes to the table. I think that to be active and believe in change is fundamentally a hopeful act. But then after hope, if we are lucky, actually change will come. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next we'll have Connie. Thank you. Um, thanks so much to Cheryl and Tiffany for your um, wonderful presentations. Um, so I'll be mostly reading from um, excerpts of a, a, a talk that I gave through UC Berkeley um, a few months ago. And I'll be switching between speaking and sharing video work. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. So the scholar Linda Yamane notes that in the Rumsian Ohlone language, there is a word, Ochans, which translates to seed times. I couldn't find any information about the word on the internet, but I've been taking this generative conceptualization as a point of departure to think about the time of seeds, of seed time. Seeds are inert as rocks, yet they hold within them the possibility of revitalizing at any moment. Through the selection of projects that I'll be sharing this evening, which all involve seeds, I'm interested in working with the idea of seed time as delayed time, staggered time, unpredictable, and slow time. My practice moves between film, video, text, drawing, and painting, and I draw heavily upon methods of assemblage and recontextualization. The work um, that I'll be sharing today focuses more on the speculative elements of my work, which, um, in which I've been sort of using uh, a fable as a stabilizing element, um, whereas my ongoing interest in environmental justice and uh, racialized contamination narratives tends to appear in some older video work, um, as well as uh, my writing and my PhD research. So since 2019, most of my creative energy has coalesced in a three-part experimental film project focused on rumors of magical seeds. The first part is titled The Lonely Age, and it's a short film that I'm very honored to show through the Asian Art Museum as part of its After Hope program. So if we could go to the next slide, um, I'd like to show a short clip. Yeah, I heard the seeds have a glow. And that there's something magic about them. I think they might be supernatural, to be honest. What would I do if I encountered one of the seeds? Or extraterrestrial, I mean. I mean, I'd approach it, or I don't know if I'd approach it. I think uh, I'd approach the I situation. Think, I, I think they're here to help. Um, encountering another human in the wild you know, or another animal of any kind, you know, I would enter the space respectfully and I think, you know, I don't want to disturb anything. That's like my thing. I just want to go my way and do uh, my thing. Could be real. I want them you to know, be real. And I think forward. that they're made real by the belief that people have in them. And I think like religion, that believing in something that will solve so many of our problems is 
perhaps a necessity in times like these to keep people going. Maybe the seeds are invented by the bio corporations to prevent the total annihilation of hope and to prevent people from not even trying, not even, you know, not providing for their needs. I don't know if I whatever they believe are. them or not. So, a lot of stories I don't know about, what the seeds are. Maybe, maybe you know, they're real. Maybe people, they're not. All of a sudden, uh, but, feeling uh, better. I want to believe that they have magical powers. The cough finally leaving, you know. But this doesn't seem doesn't seem possible. I will say this though: if it's something to look forward to, then you know, maybe that's good enough. Maybe that's all, maybe, all, maybe that's the most important thing. With the lonely age circles around rumors of magical, potentially radioactive seeds that have supposedly escaped from a GMO factory in China. Both in the film and its follow-up, Seed Time, which I'll share at the end, of my intro, I give performers collaborative improvisational games to play. And I gave all of the um, uh, people who provided voiceovers a short story to read about the seeds and asked them to respond to a set of fake interview questions. Um, so nothing was scripted. And fundamentally, The Lonely Age is a metafictional film whose tension emerges from rumors of hope. Are the seeds real? Are they actually radioactive waste from China? In a sense, it doesn't really matter the film is more about the power of belief and underlying ideologies that underpin our hoping and dreaming. While I was working on The Lonely Age last year, I also made a series of large scroll-like paintings on Mylar. Um, so this is a, a detail of one of them. So the mothers, uh, there are three of them, are metafictional altar paintings from the world of The Lonely Age. The figures are intended to be speculative versions of the rogue seeds that have captured the imaginations of the people narrating the film. So I showed these in um, conversation with the film. These images reference Chinese devotional paintings of Taoist deities, many of whom are still kept alive in the memories of the Hakim people in Southern China, where I spent many summers as I was growing up. The forms also borrow from photographs of vegetal matter, radiation deformed marine life and plastic waste. Next slide, please. Since early 2019, I've twice facilitated an ongoing social sculpture project, for lack of a better word, um, called Seed Almanac, which, um, in which I've invited members of the public to make seeds out of clay with me. In each seed making workshop, I've asked participants the following question. If you could have any seed with you at the end of the world, what would it be? Collaborators of all ages have created some extraordinary seeds, including spaghetti and meatball seeds, fork seeds, money seeds, and other and actual seeds like avocado pits and strawberries. And I see this project as a form of artistic dialogue. These workshops have also become avenues through which I've been able to have low stakes and surprisingly optimistic conversations with complete strangers about climate change, drought resistant agriculture and what survival means to each of us. Next slide, please. For the Graduate Fellows Show at the Headland Center for the Arts um, this winter, I wanted to display the seeds from um, those workshops in their own exhibition within an exhibition as a sort of primordial soup garden. Um, the glass basins each contain a soup of the clay seeds growing in live cyanobacteria colonies, which an oceanographer friend helped grow for me. And our living colonies of, uh, next slide, living colonies of Cynococcus and Prochlorococcus, two of the most abundant varieties of phytoplankton or plant plankton living in the world's oceans, which help form the basis of life on Earth. So you can sort of see them in the little green patches there, although it's not entirely clear. Um, next slide. Earlier this year, I started working on a new series of paintings, a series of 13 seed atlas panel paintings on mylar each of which is loosely inspired by one of the 13 pages of the 8th century Dunhuang Star Atlas, which is, um, uh, I guess you could say it's um, famously known to be looted uh, from Chinese archeological sites by 
uh, British and French explorers. And so this painting um, is the first finished piece in the series with others currently in progress. Next slide, please. The project is an environmental diary of sorts as they help me pictorially record how our vast wealth of ecological data can be used as a tool for wayfinding, connecting to place and localized notions of home, hoping and dreaming. The plants shown in this detail are plants that I came into contact with on a regular basis from January to June 2020 as lockdown began. Next slide. Seed Time is the second installment of an ongoing three-part experimental film project about speculative seeds, informal and collectively produced knowledge, and divergent articulations of hope amidst ongoing environmental apocalypse. It builds on the narrative began by the lonely age by following a small community of seed searchers as they navigate between hope, denial, and collective perseverance amidst cascading apocalypses and through the frame of seed time. Like the lonely age, seed time draws upon improvised voiceovers and movement to build out its narrative and was originally conceived of as an exercise in practicing the act of collectively hoping and rehearsing for future survival. I filmed it in early 2020 right before the World Health Organization declared COVID, the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. Um, so I was actually gonna show a one minute clip, but I realized I'm at 10 minutes. Um, is it okay for me to go over? I, I can also stop. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. So here I end by inviting a consideration of seeds as a framework through which to contemplate the possibilities of simultaneously occupying several different temporal registers about delayed manifestations and slow growth in the face of slow violence. Are seeds living? Are they dead? Are they alive and dead? During a short-lived stint as a K-12 science educator, I used to play a game with students that I thought of as alive or dead. Anyone with a child under the age of six probably knows this. The child points to something and asks, is it dead? Cats are alive, fur coats, dead. The kids often found their ontology especially challenged when they were confronted with marine and botanical specimens. They would look at a petri dish of tomato seeds and ask, is it dead? And I would tell them that it was not living, but that it could be. Are acorns dead? Are kernels of corn dead? Are stalks of green dead if you can germinate them with water and soil 500 years later? Or are they just sleeping? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Simone? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Simone. I am just going to share a few works that I've done over the past couple of years. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so this one is a sculpture. It's made out of um, Air Jordan 12s that I covered with tar and hand powdered glass. And when I made this, I was really thinking a lot about hybridity and the ways in which um, Black American culture um, interacts with this kind of dominant uh, capitalist culture, but makes how we make it our own in some way or another. And so I looked back towards the past and obviously I'm referencing the Nikesis, the, you know, the fetishes, what Europeans called the fetishes that were made in Western Africa um, when I made this. <laughs> I think we can go on to the next one. It's pretty straightforward. Um, this is another work that I made last year. Um, and what it is, it's, you know, it's an hourglass and it's filled with lanolin. And I started working with lanolin mm, about three or four years ago. Um, again, thinking about just kind of like the materials that are associated with blackness, I got kind of fixated on it because um, I just remembered I had this memory of looking at jars like of Dax, um, which if you don't know is a hair grease, 
I'm in elderly family members' homes when I was growing up, and it would always say on the side in really big letters, 100% pure lanolin. And that meant it was like good hair grease, right? Um, and not, I don't know, something undesirable. And for me, lanolin became what I started identifying as a surrogate body in sculptural and site-specific installation work because it was, for a lot of different reasons, but the main reason is because it was so connected. You know, this idea of hair grease is so connected to Black American identity, despite the fact that many different people of many different cultures and races all over the world continue to use it. But here it's very much like, if you mention hair grease, Blackness is two seconds away or implied or, you know, right under the subtext of the conversation. Um, so I began to use it in place for the Black body. Um, this kind of uh, took a, a different turn because at the same time I was thinking, not thinking, I was actually watching a lot of old speeches um, by 1960s civil rights leaders, um, you know, like Malcolm X, Medgar Evans, and I went back and looked at Martin Luther King and there was this quote of his about um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And so I decided to kind of merge these things together um, into this hourglass. And so basically the effect of it is that on a cold day, it doesn't move. It doesn't work if the, <laughs> if the, if the temperature is just you know, I don't know the exact temperature, but if it's like 70 or lower, it, it's not going to really move at all. But when the temperature is warm, um, it begins to drip. And so it becomes this hourglass that, you know, only really works in certain conditions. And to me, that seems like a um, kind of perfect metaphor for how various Black liberation movements in our country have taken place over the past um, many centuries that we've been here. We can go to the next slide. So this, uh, I made mean, this, it's a store, it's a boutique, and it came about um, because I was really, I don't know the right word, it's like I'm something in between like fascinated, intrigued, and horrified by the language, the visual language of um, the boutiques that began propping up all over the Bay Area during the past, um, you know, six, seven years of gentrification. And they were just like hyper curated, you know, they didn't have anything in them, um, but the few things that were in them, uh, you know, I never really walked inside, but I'm assuming they were very expensive. And, um, the just walking down streets that were once familiar streets that I walked down, you know, as a child, teenager, or so on, um, just became littered with this, these like, again, just boutiques. I don't, I didn't really understand it. I mean, I do understand it, but I understood them as being intense symbols of displacement, um, displacement of black and brown communities. Um, because these were not locations where boutiques existed before. And so I had the opportunity to do a solo exhibition and I decided to turn the gallery into a boutique. Um, but my boutique, and I even had like the fancy French <laughs> name, which is not so fancy, Negre. And Negre came from um, Fanon, Franz Fanon. And that in the original French version of um, black skin, white masks, and I don't remember what chapter it was, chapter three, chapter five, whatever chapter he says, look a Negro. Um, in French, you know, Negro is negre. And it exists as a word that's somewhere in between Negro and nigger. Um, but it's also a disappeared word in French, where if you ask, you know, a contemporary French person today, what negre means, it means ghostwriter. And they have kind of like the cultural memory of it ever referring to Black people um, is gone uh, for, you know, white, indigenous French people, not people of color. 
And so I think we can go to the next slide. <laughs> And so again, I just kind of created the shop and everything in there that was sold um, was made by black people who either, most people still lived in the Bay Area, but there were a couple of people who, um, you know, had to leave by choice, by force, um, you know, economic forces. Um, and the black was also obviously a prominent like theme as far as the colors of the choice that I, choices of what I decided to uh, fill the boutique with. Um, I think I'm going to stop and just go into the next slide. And can we play this? a performance that I made in collaboration with Mia Pixley, who's the cellist that you see there. And um, before I approached Mia, um, one thing that I really wanted to do was to incorporate music into my practice um, more directly. I've done that before, but, you know, making music or yeah, making music. And so we did this at a site and basically we made a, um, a requiem. Although someone told me it's a nocturne. So we made, you know, a piece um, that was reflective of the cycles of movement of uh, Black American people, um, specifically we were thinking, I was thinking about the Great Migration and how um, many members of my family ended up in the Bay Area or other parts of California um, between the 1930s and the 1990s, leaving from the South um, to be in a place that um, offered, you know, at least a little bit more freedom than Jim Crow or of the post-civil rights era South um, and how there was this new thing that was happening at the time that people were calling the new great migration. And what it is basically is um, tons of people, mainly younger black people. I mean, they're all black, but you know, mainly younger people but not necessarily only people under 35 or so. Um, are moving from major coastal urban centers, California and up, you know, Boston and up, and moving back to the South because of, again, these kind of um, social economic forces. It's no longer affordable to be there in the South um, is the only places where people can live. And that made me just have to stop and pause for a minute to reflect on that because, um, you know, the South is, can be great in a, numerous ways, but it's also uh, pretty horrifying in numerous ways. So the fact that um, we're in a world where people um, who do face 
of serious risks by going back to the South, especially because they weren't raised there, especially because they don't know social codes and things like that, um, or being forced to move there. Um, is was just a little, a little, a little sad to me. And so we made a song about it. And I think I'm going to end my presentation there. I'm looking at the time. Padma. <laughs> oh, should I keep going? Okay, I'll keep going. We this have is time if you want to keep going. So <laughs> <laughs> this is another work that I made using lanolin. Um, again, so I talked about these surrogate bodies and how lanolin for me functions as like a formal surrogate for the black body. Um, so for this, I filled the windows with lanolin. And so the yellow spaces in my little Mondrian are pure lanolin, 100% pure lanolin. And then the black spaces are 100, not sorry, it's the lanolin mixed with activated charcoal. And the red is lanolin mixed with paprika. And so, what happened was that, you know, when I, the day that I painted it on, it looked perfect and whatever, but lanolin begins to fall. Um, and that's something that I've used before in works, this kind of, you know, again, with the hourglass, but also other works, um, you know, responds to the temperature. So every afternoon, I think between like around 4.30ish, it would get hit with direct sunlight and the lanolin would begin to melt. Um, like literally slide down from the glass and onto the gallery floor. So that by the end of the exhibition, um, there was a significant amount of black and yellow lanolin on the ground. And we can go to the next slide. And I feel like this is straightforward too. It's a flag that I made. Um, you know, the kind of cute story behind it is that I went with um, a couple of friends to watch Confederate statues be removed from public spaces in New Orleans a few months before I made that. And um, yeah, there are a lot of people out. Um, David Duke rallied the Klan by saying that the removal of those statues was white genocide. And it was the first time I ever heard that word. So I was like, who has ever killed white people? This is, I mean, oh my gosh, white genocide, what is this? Um, but when I, we got to the, um, I guess, counter protest, um, there were a lot, of, a lot of white supremacists there and I'd never been in a space with that many overt white supremacists. And they all had flags, they had like, Trump 2020 flags, um, the flag that I was told was a Blue Lives Matters flag. I don't really know what that is. Um, and then they also had a lot of Confederate flags. So they're like screaming, you know, this is evil, whatever, whatever. Um, and to me, after seeing, how many statues did I see take down? I think after I saw the second statue take down and there was just this repetition of this kind of, um, I guess a, a white mourning of this loss of whatever the Confederacy represents to them. It really struck me as kind of ridiculous because we were in New Orleans and like, despite all that's happened to New Orleans as far as gentrification um, post Hurricane Katrina, it's still a very, very black city. And so for people to come in, especially people to come in from other states and try to defend um, a very, very black city. Um, I mean, try to defend, you know, these statues from being removed from a very, very black city was just really, really strange to me because they would talk about culture and legacy and history and all this stuff, but it, there were a lot of erasures because the South, you know, the entire place that would have been the Confederate States um, once the indigenous people were either forced out or murdered, um, was predominantly black um, for much of this country's history. So I wanted to make a flag that kind of reflected that 
and showed the South as the homeland of, you know, Black American culture. And I made this. That's all I've got. Like, that's all I've said. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all for those incredible presentations. Um, they're so engrossing in each project. And like, it's wonderful to hear about all your works and all the projects you've done and to hear you explain them and, and kind of give some context. It's, it's also amazing to see them in, in conversation and dialogue with each other, right? Presented alongside. Um, so now we're gonna, we have time for kind of conversation. And the goal of this is for us all to talk about what we just saw and what you shared uh, and to see if we can find some kind of points of connection dialogue between your projects. Um, this is always a little challenging in Zoom. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll just go along with it. Um, and maybe just to get us started, I'll, I'll start with a question that I hope uh, our presenters will kind of take over uh, very quickly. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to start with this question around time um, and time as it shows up in your work. I think each of you, everybody's projects in some ways talks about time, whether it's um, kind of the embodied time of the hourglass that you just talked about, Simone, or the cycles of time that you talked about, Cheryl, or inherited memory as a kind of record of time and catastrophe, as you talked about, Tiffany, or seeds of time, right, that you talked about, Connie. So I guess um, it's kind of an open question for everyone, if you could talk a little bit about the importance of time in your work, how it's important, how it shows up, uh, and perhaps what it reveals or tells us or, or suggests. I will start. Um, I think for me, time time shows up a lot for me because I find in my practice that I really enjoy placing historical drawings and photographs into contemporary dialogues. Um, so for example, when I had my show at Moed, one of the places that that really showed up was finding like more than one image of Black people with their hands in the air from the 1800s. Um, and it was a way to open a dialogue about, you know, hands up, don't shoot is not a new concept in the Black community because here we are looking at all these images um, from history, both in novels as well as in, you know, drawings of, you know, a variety of settings in the diaspora of Black people with their hands up or being chased. Um, so that's just, you know, one way that time shows up. I think in the project I showed this evening, you know, time showed up for me because I felt like it was time for us to not only reconsider Thomas Jefferson's legacy, um, but also the Black side of his family, the Hemings. And so to have the opportunity to look at that through a French and American lens as France was very important um, to both sides of that family, the white and the black side of the family. Um, it was an entree for me to really have a conversation with people about Charlottesville and why we could have a race riot in Charlottesville that was less than three miles from a major plantation that up until, you know, the last decade never acknowledged that there was a black side of the family, the Hemings. So, for me, time is just a way to weave in and out of this narrative of history, history and contemporary conversation. I guess I'll go. <laughs> so I think about time in a lot of different ways, um, but I think to address this question, it's really important to understand and acknowledge um, how these histories shape our present. Um, and especially because for many of us, they're ines inescapable. Um, if we, again, like want to know why there is racial injustice or something against black people, um, we have to look at in the past, right? Because if we go through this, you know, the past, if we go, you know, take on this, like the past doesn't matter kind of ideology 
one would be lost. It would be confusing. One wouldn't understand. But when you realize like, oh, this is actually centuries in the making, um, it makes a lot of sense. So I feel like we have to move, or I particularly have to move um, back and forth in time to make sense of today. Yeah, I am. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, what what you said about time as a way of, or thinking about time as a way of thinking about history, and the sort of like ongoingness of history and never endingness of it, and how, um, yeah, and also how like hope I feel like is possible often when, at least for me, like. You know, when I'm in my like most pessimistic moments where I'm like, oh God, things are never gonna change. I like when I think about the sort of like ongoingness of time and how long it takes for change to actually happen and how like the events from 300 years ago are still affecting our realities today, then that's like a helpful reminder to me. And also just like, yeah, it, it's, it's very humbling to um, for me to think about like, how just like a long time scale of things. And I think for, for me in my work, I am, um, I'm really interested in how different time scales intersect. So like geological time, which is so slow, you know, it's like, like humans have only been on this earth for like a fraction um, of a second compared to how long plants or birds or like rocks <laughs> have been around and, um, and so, yeah, just like thinking about our like history relative to that and also like, um, yeah, I'm really just interested in the ways that like thinking about how much time like individual lives have on this earth and, um, and just thinking about that relative to like longer arcs of history. Um, that's something that I, I'm really interested in, in working with in my video work especially. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm also like very, uh, I think a lot about um, the, the slow, the like, I guess time in terms of my practice, how I repeatedly return to certain works. Like I, like my process is very circular. Like I kind of come back to scribbles, um, that I made like four years ago and uh, trying to find new points of connection there. And that's, and I feel like that sort of um, like recognition of or like working with the sort of like nonlinear process of time is like a really important part of intuition. Um, well, it's really good to hear uh, you, all three of you um, talking about the concept of time, how it's unfolded and the importance of it in your work. And I think uh, with Cheryl and, and Simon, uh, Simone, I think we share that kind of interest in history, that how we have to look at history to understand how it shapes the, the present and also what we can learn from it. Um, and it's just so important because I just feel like, you know, in a lot of our work, you, you see that collapse of time and also terrain, right? I mean, things happening here, things happening there, things that happened in the past in one place that like you could totally like trace that to uh, what happened elsewhere. And I think it's so important to make that connection because, and then we just don't, focus and, and you know on that kind of little uh, micro world of ours but you know branch out and understand um, others people's histories as well and I think if you, we look at the um, colonial ambitions I don't think they are really far off from from the visions of modernity so those are something that I I think a lot about in my work and also you know the fact that it's almost impossible to access the past, that is something that really motivates me or almost makes me go crazy, like trying to um, excavate those layers of, of history and memories. 
Um, and then I, I agree with Connie. I think even in my writing, you know, I, I would revisit things that I've written in like, I don't know, 2009, 2003. And, then I, and those really all the uh, journal entries that I have kept over the years really helped me to understand my work. Like if I make a, a new work, I don't think I'm able to talk about it right away, but it takes time to process, to even to understand and also to make connection to other work. So I think, yeah, that's how we operate. Well, I wonder what was there that you guys see the similarities or the themes that run through in most of our work. I mean, we don't have to forge connections, but I think there are connections. That's why we all here. I was definitely struck by the theme of migration and how that absolutely came through in all of our works, either through, you know, family histories of migration, migration across countries, um, the migration of seeds and nature, which can be just boundless. So I definitely saw a strong connection around migration and also um, a sense of water, you know, certainly um, more overt in the works that you shared with us, Tiffany, and Connie, you know, but there's certainly an implied sense of water um, in Simone and my work, um, whether it's, you know, Jefferson and the transatlantic to France and the transatlantic slave trade. So there is always a sense of water within a conversation about diaspora. So those two struck me right away. I also saw, um a really strong care and concern for um, the communities in your work. And, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you all work with that in very different ways um, and in ways that are both like public facing and more hermeneutic um, and internal. And uh, yeah, and I also am really interested in the material play in your your works as well, like the like I want to touch everything, and um, and there and I like yeah, and just like the I think the care in the work too. I actually hadn't heard about this. I thought about this until you, you all started talking, but I was curious if there's like a difference between like your private practice, like what you how you practice kind of on your own versus like the public face of it. And if, if those merge move between each other or if uh, they show up differently, um, or if there's some things that you like to not share publicly and, and how, they, how, you, how you mediate between kind of the private act of creating and, and working and the kind of more public presentation of it. Pema, I think being an artist, I mean, unless you're just so private and you keep everything to yourself, I don't see that privacy uh, so much. I mean, even our birth year, our um, biography, I mean, the world knows about it. I mean, even if I don't want people to, to know where I live, I mean, it's listed, right, in like an exhibition website. So what? Um, the sense of privacy, I mean, I don't, I gave up on that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I feel similar um, with a different approach. Um, I try to maintain some sort of privacy, but my work is generally made to be shared. Um, and I do understand when something fails um, you know, don't share it because it sucks. Mm -hmm. But when, you know, it's successful or I think it's successful, it's made to be shared. Um, so there's no real distinction. Anything not being shared is either still in progress and there are some projects which take years to realize 
um, because of whatever research or materials or whatever I'm doing, like I'm dealing with one of those now, it's almost on year two. Um, but yeah, it's for, it's not for me. Um, I mean, in many ways it is for me because it's answering my own questions. It's my way of, you know, investigating and interrogating the world, but it's for me to be in dialogue with other people. Um, so it's to be shared. Yeah, I, um, I feel like I try to have like multiple streams of work going all the time. And some that, uh, cause I think if I only made work with the intention of sharing it, it, I, uh, I would go crazy. Like I've definitely, like, I, I mean, when I was in grad school, I found that my prep, like I, I felt like I was making a lot of work for critique and um, for people to respond to in a particular way. And I hated that um, when I finished and I was like, yeah, I feel like I needed to like stage an intervention on like my own practice. And uh, cause yeah, like some of it was starting to feel very predetermined for me. And, um, and so I, I've, I mean, I received some advice like over the years that I found really helpful um, in terms of like maintaining that balance or like tension between um, work that is private and work that never, yet yeah, work that is for um, the public or an audience. And uh, yeah, and so thinking about like having multiple points of entry to each work and having, um, and like making sure that I always have some very sort of like low stakes um, like exercises that I'm doing to sort of keep um, the more embodied elements of my practice feeling very fresh. Like that's been really important to me. And um, I will, yeah, like, like the animations that uh, I showed in my like last video piece, I, those started out as just like warm ups, um, and and then when I made enough of them, I, I started playing around with animating them and felt like it was like, oh, actually there's something like, I, I'm, I wanna put this in conversation with the, the, um, the more photographic elements. And yeah, I will say that like the pandemic has definitely made me um, or helped me uh, be more okay with making more like inward facing therapeutic work um, and yeah and I'm like very interested in seeing how that plays out like what like incubates right now as I'm playing around more than I was uh, prior to the pandemic. I think the part that you know is personal that's more public now is the autobiographical stories, which I just shared a taste of this evening, you know, um, I have very dear friends that run a project that's really geared toward training activists and artists and others how to share their stories called the Million Person Project. And, you know, having done some of their training and coaching, um, when we were all locked up and suddenly weren't having a show at the French embassy, it was like, oh, maybe this is the time that I should like, you know, pull from some of these personal stories. And it actually, I think was very instructive to the activist in me because, um, you know, I think part of the challenge of the great reckoning right now, if we want to call it that, but, you know, as America grapples with racism, again, keyword again, um, I'm reminded how much humans have to have things personally. You know, we cannot get to systemic change until we have some type of personal connection. And so, you know, what I found through this project and sharing these stories was that not only, you know, did people that didn't know me get interested in it because they had never spent a lot of time really diving into Thomas Jefferson, um, nor, you know, people that really knew me or I thought really knew me were like, I didn't know any of this about your family. Why have you been sitting on this all these years? You know, so I think that's the part that, 
you know, I have a growing comfort with, you know, um, and I just try to think about, you know, the wonderful Maya Angelou who made autobiographical stories in art form, you know, and I think that there is something to be said um, for being more open with who I am and how that relates to the art that I make. And I think, you know, to be more vulnerable is okay too. Um, I, I had a hard time in the past sharing, um, you know, making work about, you know, that focus on my history, personal history and family. And I think even if I don't focus on that, it's still this driving force behind all of my project, right? So to be able to share it and to be vulnerable about it is a way to connect to to your audience and to other um, artists, right? And also in your case, Cheryl, you talk about activism too, right? So, I mean, how do we build a community without actively sharing uh, about our own experiences? So I think it's, it's really good. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that Connie mentioned the pandemic because I feel like with the pandemic, I, I know that all of my projects are ongoing and there is a big commitment into seeing it through. I don't even know when that will be. <laughs> I just have to, to do because there's so much work that still needs to be done. But because of the pandemic, I, you know, there's like a lot of projects being pushed further or canceled. So therefore I have time to do what I want. So like experiment something else. So last night I did a presentation where I held up like works that I've done on things like bird migration routes or the shrinking of the Aero Sea is like, but it's really beautiful. And it didn't really take a whole lot of research. I just wanted to do something different, right? I want to take a break from people and from traumas and from disasters and do something uh, different. And I think uh, the pandemic really in a way allows me that time to do that and that space to right not having to always meet production deadline and and also time to read just like doing a lot of reading instead of running around wonderful um, maybe that's a good place to transition we have about 10 minutes left uh, so uh, this is maybe a nice chance to kind of open it up to everybody here uh, if you have a question you want to ask uh, a panelist, uh, please put it in the question and answer box or the chat, uh, whichever is easier for you. We have two questions already, so I'll just kind of jump into them in the order that they came. The first is from Daniel, um, and it's directed uh, to you, Simone, but I think it's ap applicable to, to anybody. Um, how does location affect the power of an installation? Uh, and how does um, it being in a first world country impact the meaning of an artwork? You're actually muted, so you might have to unmute, Simone. <laughs> okay. um, installations are all about the location, you know? Um, and I, when I am preparing something, I usually spend time at the site um, over several visits. Um, for instance, before I made the, um, the stained glass lanolin piece, I just observed the time, right? Because I wanted to know how long the sun hit at what time, you know, for what duration, because if it hit too long, then it would just fall apart of, you know, it was, ended up being kind of perfect um, for that site. Um, and the same for Negr, um, where I, I was already familiar with that area um, because of relatives who lived there. But, um, you know, it was it was again this kind of perfect site because there were overly curated shops on every single side, but for some reason that side of you know the block was just didn't have it yet. So I could put in a little bit of black possibility right on that side of the street. Um, first world location, obviously being a first worlder, no matter what your racial background, living in the first world. Um, enhances privilege <laughs> in numerous ways. I've never made a site-specific installation outside of the first of my line. 
No, I've never made a site specific installation outside of the first world. So I don't, I don't have um, comparison, but I do imagine um, other people can probably respond to this a little bit better, but there would be a lot more challenges, even um, working in say Europe, I find it more difficult to access things because we have so much in this country, like it's ridiculous. Like I need 50 yards of nylon string, like or whatever, neon purple nylon string in an hour, we can get it. And that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. So. I could second that, uh, Simone. <laughs> it's really hard to get things done outside of the US and, and in a lot of third world or so-called third world countries where we do Biennale or Triennales, people run around until the very end, until the last minute. So yeah, we do have a lot of privilege here. Awesome. Um, we had one other question um, uh, that came up in the question box and it's from Greg. Uh, there's a thread of activism and exploration of power, voice, and erasure. I wonder if the artists could speak to if they found their work, uh, sorry, if they find their work in activism. Uh, and was it activism that brought them to the art, or did art bring them to activism? Well, I, I can say that it I was both, you know, and that was part of what I shared in the beginning of, you know, my wonderful mother um, who couldn't understand how she had a daughter who was an artist and an activist. But I actually got my first instrument when I was three, which was the violin. And when I went to college in New York City, it was not to go to college, it was to be on Broadway. And my mother knew that. Um, and so, you know, I also found my voice as an activist in New York City because I was there in the early 1980s. And so um, I was very active on campus in South African divestment. We had a race riot on my campus by my senior year. So I did anti-racist work on campus. Um, I also, because it was the early days of the first pandemic, HIV AIDS, I was very active um, with what was called you know, ACT UP for people that remember ACT UP. And then because women have to do their own thing, we were like, okay, men, that's great. And we formed Women's Health Action Mobilization, WAM, which was the sister to ACT UP. So, you know, the 80s were just a time of a lot of activism and issues for me. And I think the art came into it because literally my job was to be the person that was the junior freshman to learn how to make the flyers for the protest. So I remember apprenticing under like a junior who was the guy that made all the flyers for the protest, you know, and I could say that was probably the early seeds of visual art that came out, you know, 20 years later after doing no art. I, I never thought exclusively of my art as a way to change society. I think it's more direct now than ever. Um, I know people in the Bay Area were able to go visit the De Young Open before um, the museums had to close again. You know, I think my piece in that show is the most pointed and direct activist work I've done. It's a piece called 2017 Year at a Glance, 214 Dead Black Men. And I have been working on the full series of data that shows um, police killings in the US. But I think my work is always about social commentary. And then on occasions, such as the police brutality work, it's really pointed at social change. Um, yeah, I think in my case, um, I, my thoughts, um, around the power of collectivity, uh, that I try to explore in my video work, that's definitely influenced by, um, uh, organizing work. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I generally try, I mean, this is something that I'm like working through, but I, I see activism as related crucially to um, my work, my artistic work, but I sort of have like two different streams of visual production going. Um, I have like the, the artistic work that I make under my own name that I present 
under my own name. That's um, work that doesn't explicitly, um, you know, that's not work that I think of as like activist work. But I also have this other visual, this, yeah, this other like stream going where I do things um, anonymously. And uh, so like protest banners or like videos that I've made for campaigns and stuff, like that's all, that's all work that I don't associate with myself um, in a public space because that's not what that work calls for. And, um, and that's, you know, that's like, yeah. And so I think um, I, like my work, my or rather the work that I'm presenting that I'm presenting today, I, I don't think it would be what it was if it weren't for um, my exposure to and connection with um, environmental justice movements, even if that's not something that I explicitly reference or um, illustrate or call upon in the work. But you know, like the the ideas of the people I'm working with and um, that I organize with and the you know readings and concepts that I've been exposed to as a result of those spaces and communities that's all um, those all feed into my visual work in ways that I think I'm not always aware of um, immediately yeah for me I feel like um, my artwork and my activism especially in my early mid 20s were very, very distinct. Um, and even now, I think it's more like you're looking at artwork that's made by an activist in the sense that I think there are very much more effective ways to do activism than putting work in a gallery. Um, and so, but you're still, you know, these are the things I think about. These are the things that are in my mind, whether, you know, no matter what sphere of life I'm in. So it just kind of comes out as this artwork. Um, but sometimes, you know, I feel like the art <clears throat> can become a distraction and it's better to be in the streets. Wow. Well, that sounds really uh, amazing, Simone. I, you know, I don't see my work um, as like full on activism although it could be and and you know there are people who think my work has that aspect in it uh, but i came to art first and foremost and the activism um, became part of it if there is um, just because you know as you learn history you realize that there's a lot of things that need to be changed a lot of work needs to be done so that's how um, you know it it's slowly becoming about uh, something more than just art. Um, but, but I know my position and I see my position as first and foremost as an artist. Uh, although I, I'm also aware that there are certain platforms that uh, you can use art um, to speak to a big, you know, for a bigger cause, like bigger than your artwork. Um, and also in terms of like, you know, a court, like taking action it's, you know, with my work on refugees, it's one thing is I do work that discuss issues on, you know, on refugees and I particularly interested in policies for that matter because you do, I mean, we do need to change policy and how do you do that, right? So um, as an artist, we, we can only do so much. So besides making art, I organize panel discussions on certain policies that you know, bring in different um, actors and talking about it. So that's also one way, but it is part of my work, but it's not really my work. Like I don't show that kind of work, you know, at a gallery or at a museum, but it's gonna be a public program that goes along with it, um, that gives the time and the space and the opportunity for, for people to come together and, and discuss. What a great place to, to end. So we're, we're finished with the time. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined this evening. And thank you again to our wonderful uh, presenters uh, for sharing your work and thoughts uh, and for giving us so much to think about and be inspired by. We appreciate it.
Thank you, Padma, for leading this uh, conversation. And thank you, Simone, Tiffany, Cheryl, and Connie for your incredible work and for sharing it with us tonight. Um, and we look forward to uh, when we can see After Hope videos of resistance at the Asian Art Museum. Um, so please do check back with their website to see when that will be available. Um, everything is in flux right now. Um, Cheryl and Simone, do you um, have anything to share with us about where we can see your work coming up? Next year. <laughs> uh, time to be deprived. I think I'm, I'm doing a solo show, but who knows? Yeah. Like, everything's pushed back. Yeah. I hope the De Young reopens before January 3rd so more people can get to see the De Young open before it closes. Yeah, fingers crossed. All right, well, please um, take the time to find these artists on their social media and follow what they're doing. Um, I want to thank the Asian Art Museum for partnering with Museum of the African Diaspora to present tonight's program. Um, it's been really wonderful to get MOAD artists and Asian Art Museum artists together. Um, and Please do support both institutions. We'd love to have you as members. Um, if you can donate to the institutions to help support us through this challenging time, we would appreciate it. Um, I wanna thank again, Abby Chen, Elisa Alexander and Padma Maitland for, um, and of course, Elena Gross um, for bringing this program together and for making it such a lovely evening. Thank you all and please be safe.